Thank you. I uh, would like to uh, follow up on that uh, wonderful uh, presentation of uh, Professor Pavrotnik and talk a fair amount about the same things. Uh, as you see here, uh, the title of this is Aging, Sarcopenia, and Fracture. Unlike the prior talk, which was based almost entirely upon research evidence, a fair amount of this talk will be based upon opinion. And uh, as you see here, some of this is my opinion, and you will notice that by the orange text. As you know, the population of the planet of, of older adults is increasing dramatically. And uh, here are data from uh, the United Nations, uh, 2015, the map on the top, 2050, the map on the bottom, such that by the year 2050, uh, roughly one-third of Europe and roughly a quarter of Ukraine will be over age 60, and that's really consistent with much of the planet. You've seen this classic slide from Cyrus Cooper in the prior talk demonstrating that fractures increase dramatically with advancing age in both men and women. Uh, such that the median age of hip fracture in women is age 83. So obviously with more older adults, there's going to be more hip fractures. What's the importance of that? And that was already <coughs> stated in the prior talk. And that is the first that roughly one in four older adults who sustains a hip fracture dies within the coming year. And of equal, or perhaps even more importance, is the effect on our quality of life and independence. So really, it's the fracture that's important. Fractures threaten quality of life and threaten our independence. And so I would suggest to you that maintaining quality of life and independence is the reason to reduce fractures. Now, dogma holds that fractures increase because bone... Eh, because bone mineral density declines with advancing age. Dogma is often wrong. And uh, here, it's clear that bone mineral density does not have the dramatic decline in concert with the dramatic increase in fracture risk as we age. So fracture risk clearly is not just bone. We've known this for years, and uh, here are uh, data from the Rotterdam study demonstrating that if we just focus upon bone, and utilize a T-score definition of osteoporosis, we capture only 44% of women, and these are female data, and not showing, we capture only 21% of men who will sustain, quote, osteoporotic fractures. Uh, so clearly, we can't focus just on bone. What uh, these data are often utilized for is to emphasize the importance of osteopenia, but I'd like to point out that a substantial proportion of people sustain, quote, osteoporotic fractures with normal bone mineral density. In this study, roughly 18% of men and 13% of women. So we need to focus more than just on the bone. And I think it's reasonable to ask, why do fractures increase with age? And this is clearly an oversimplification. There's multiple reasons that fractures increase with age. But a big one is that falls become common with advancing age. About a third of us over age 65 and almost half of us over age 75 fall every year, and these falls cause fractures. 
over 90% of hip fractures are caused by falls. And in fact, unsurprisingly, falls risk factors predict hip fracture independent of BMD. And some of these falls risk factors include, as could be expected, a history of falls, self-reported poor health, self-reported physical activity, and slower walking speed. And I would suggest to you that these risk factors are indicators of impaired function. And it's impaired function with the resultant increase in falls is what actually predicts fractures. And here is a slide of data from the Mr. Oz study, and these are men over age 65. And these are classic functional tests, chair stands, leg power, gait speed, grip strength. And what you see is that the men who are in the lowest quartile of all of these functional tests have a higher risk for hip fracture. And these authors concluded, as you see, that poor physical function is independently associated with an increased risk for hip fracture. And that takes us to sarcopenia, and we've already had that introduced in the prior talk. Uh, this is uh, one of the definitions, and that is the age-associated loss of muscle mass and function. It's a complex syndrome associated with muscle mass alone or in conjunction with increased fat mass. I'm not going to go through the pathogenesis of sarcopenia in any detail today, and yet you can read this as well as I can read it to you, but it's multifactorial and includes hormonal declines, inflammation, poor nutrition, being sedentary, being exposed to toxins, neuronal loss, and this leads to reduced muscle quality expressed ultimately as reduced function. I would suggest to you that the same slide could be utilized for osteoporosis. So it's, in essence, the same pathophysiologies as on the prior slide, but here, rather than going to reduced muscle quality, we have reduced bone quality. And I'd ask you to consider that perhaps osteoporosis and sarcopenia are basically the same process expressed in different tissues with the ultimate consequence or the ultimate disease being falls and fractures. <clears throat> there are data that document that in women with hip fracture, osteoporosis and sarcopenia are common and common together. And in this study from Italy of roughly 300 women, what you see is almost half of them had both sarcopenia and osteoporosis. And the authors concluded that preventive strategies and treatments for sarcopenia and osteoporosis should be brought forward. But even considering bone and muscle isn't enough, as I noted in the uh, fielding sarcopenia definition, we need to think about obesity. And here's a uh, large study, the GLOW study, that Juliet Comston published. And uh, what you see is that at least for some fractures, the ankle fracture, leg fractures, women with obesity, BMI greater than or equal to 30, had a higher fracture rate. And so obesity is not protective from fractures, rather it can increase fracture risk. And you're all well aware of the worldwide obesity epidemic. Uh, Planet-wide, we are becoming fatter. I think it's uh, dramatic to look here back at 1975. This is the proportion of individuals with obesity, the darker red colors, higher proportion and to compare this 2014 map, sorry, this 2014 map to 1975, you can see the dramatic increase in obesity worldwide. And that similarly, I understand, is happening uh, in Ukraine. 
Now, obesity not only increases fracture risk, but it can increase falls risk. And these are data from uh, Australia. And what we see here on the left is the uh, percentage of uh, women who fell within the past 12 months based upon BMI. The purple bars are the women with obesity, BMI greater than 30, and they were more likely to fall than the women who weighed less. And then among the women who fell, and that's the right-hand bar, the proportion who fell multiple times was highest in those with obesity. And I think common sense would say if you fall more than once, you're more likely to break than if you only fall once or not at all. And indeed, falls tell us who is going to fracture. This is the concept of imminent fracture risk. And uh, this is a large data set. I'm not going to go through it in any detail at all. The punchline is in the red box. And uh, these are uh, individuals uh, who uh, uh, were followed for a year. And the usual risk factors for fracture were looked at. Impaired mobility, various drugs, dementia, age, and the thing that predicts subsequent fracture much greater than anything else is prior falls. So falls tell us who's going to break. In thinking about obesity, we, we need to consider the concept of sarcopenic obesity, and that's the concept of low muscle mass and function, i.e. sarcopenia, and high fat mass, i.e. obesity, and that adversely affects health and independence, and I generally depict that as shown here. If you're going to carry a lot of weight around, you need to have a big motor, not a small motor. So you need a lot of muscle mass to carry around a lot of weight. So to summarize then, not enough bone, osteoporosis, not enough muscle, sarcopenia, and too much fat, obesity, is bad. And that's these, these individuals here. And what should the diagnosis be for those individuals? We suggested a, a number of years ago now that rather than just focusing on osteoporosis or focusing on obesity or focusing on sarcopenia, that this gives us an opportunity to combine risk factor, these risk factors together and after struggling to come up with a term, we brought forward the term dysmobility syndrome. And dysmobility simply means difficulty walking. And in addition to obesity and sarcopenia and osteoporosis, this allows us to consider other things that might cause difficulty walking or increase falls risk, such as osteoarthritis, neuropathy, diabetes, balance, etc. And as Professor Pavrajnik told us in the prior talk, we should learn from the past. And uh, I think that this is a nice example of simply taking someone else's idea and adapting it to the diseases that we're interested in. And you're, you're all familiar with the metabolic syndrome, which is the concept of hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And this syndrome, in concert with advancing age, family history, Toxin exposures leads to heart attack or myocardial infarction, which leads to various bad outcomes, including death. This is the premise upon which this mobility was based, where we took a, a number of concerns, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, diabetes, obesity, and other things, with aging, family history, toxins, leading to falls, fractures, disability, and bad outcomes. It wasn't like we came up with this idea on our own. It was simply that others had shown us the way. And it's my bias that treating osteoporosis, just using a bone drug, without considering other parts of the syndrome that causes fractures is the same as treating the lipids and ignoring the blood pressure and diabetes in people with metabolic syndrome. 
So is there any evidence that dysmobility is linked to adverse health outcomes? And the answer is yes. Here's data from Ann Haynes where Ann Looker uh, utilized the uh, disability uh, or dysmobility concept and found higher hazard ratios for mortality in both men and women, white and black. And similarly, Bjorn Buring from our group published this recently in uh, using the Mr. Oz data. And what he showed is that dysmobility plus high frax. So frax is in red, dysmobility is in green. The concept, the combination together dramatically increased the risk for fractures. So in summary then, the health concept that's of importance is fracture and that osteoporosis, sarcopenia, obesity, and other conditions are part of this. Can we take this to clinical care? And I think the answer is yes. As you know, we don't have perfect consensus definitions for sarcopenia nor for dysmobility, but we do see patients. And we can ask them simple questions. How many times have you fallen in the past year? And if you fell, were you injured? And then we can ask people to stand up. And if uh, the patient uh, cannot stand up, so if you have relatively normal muscle function, and your patient is sitting in your office, and you ask them to stand up, they stand up. And if they can't stand up, if they know they have muscle weakness, they have sarcopenia, they have sarcopenic obesity, what do you see? They rock forward, they put their arms on their knees, and they, they stand up that way. And in my clinic, when I see that, that is the diagnosis of dysmobility, and that means we need to pay attention to the components of that. And so what does that look like? And I, I think it looks like what we've been calling osteoporosis. So we need to think about falls risk reduction exercise, physical therapy, and nutrition. Under nutrition, despite the focus on obesity, undernutrition is common in older adults. And so when you see malnutrition, we need to think about that. Inadequate protein has already been mentioned with the higher recommended intakes, calcium D, and medications. Clearly exercise works. Exercise reduces injurious falls. Uh, this is odds ratio. Odds ratio of one is up here. Exercise cuts the risk in half. Addressing vision or vision and environment or multiple things. We can dramatically reduce injurious falls risk. And here I think are two slides that speak to a common sense clinical approach to reduce falls, and the first is to start with medications. So do we really need all these drugs? Do we need the neuroleptics, the antipsychotics, the antidepressants, the sleeping pills, the antihistamines, and remember alcohol. Alcohol can cause us to fall down at age 18. It can cause us to fall down at age 80. And then get our physical therapy colleagues involved and help with that. There's controversy about calcium supplementation. In fact, at the ASBMR meeting this fall, uh, there was still yet another calcium and vitamin D debate. And in the absence of definitive data, I think we need to apply common sense. And common sense says that the historical calcium intake was roughly 1,600 to 1,800 milligrams per day. That's close to the Institute of Medicine recommendation. Similarly, common sense about vitamin D says we were designed to live outdoors. And uh, here are two studies of highly sun-exposed individuals. Here's our surfer study from a number of years ago uh, with a retrospectively standardized 25D. The mean concentration was 36. Here are uh, some of the few hunter-gatherers left on the planet. Uh, they're mean 25D is 46 nanograms per mil. We mentioned protein. Do we have drugs for sarcopenia? The answer is no. Uh, I think there are potentials with the selective androgen receptor agonists, the myostatin antagonists, but these drugs are not close and they are, their development is slow and languishing. So we don't have the muscle drugs today, but we do have bone drugs and they work. They cut fracture risk roughly in half, but they're not being used. Why is that? 
uh, at least in the United States, it's because we have not conveyed risk benefit. We have not said the words independence. We have not said we're treating this to keep you having a high quality of life. And so what this slide is, is data from the U.S. National Osteoporosis Foundation. 40% of patients said they never started a prescribed osteoporosis medication. And when asked why that was, 80% due to fear of side effects and 40% because they didn't know if there was benefit. We clearly have not conveyed the data adequately. And as I said, quality of life and independence is what we need to emphasize. And finally, I, I want to ask you to consider some new concepts and recognize that acute illness in older adults is what causes bone loss and causes muscle loss and therefore dismobility and therefore falls and fractures. This is the classical teaching that um, muscle function declines with advancing age. And I would suggest to you that that's wrong. What truly happens as we age is we stay stable until something happens to us. Here we have a knee replacement and our muscle function goes down, never, never quite gets back to where it was. We then have septicemia, down we go again, <coughs> pneumonia, down we go again until we have our hip fracture. And when the statisticians look at these stepwise decrements, they give us this smooth line. But on an individual basis, it's de decremental. And in fact, this is also not a new concept that this happens with bone. Professor Robert Haney told us this over a decade ago. And he showed us data that that is the case. And what he said is that if illnesses lead to substantial bone loss, they could be an important component of age-related bone loss. And then he went on to show us that in one of the big pharma trials. And so if we just look here at the hospitalized women compared to the non-hospitalized women, and we look at trochanteric BMD, and this is change per year, the women who were hospitalized have almost three times as much bone loss. And so what we accept as age-related bone loss is in fact acute illness-induced bone loss. And similarly, acute illness and hospitalization reduces muscle function. This is activities of daily living. 45% had a decrease in the ability to perform their activities of daily living at time of discharge compared to admission. And 15%, almost one in eight, fell within a month of hospitalization. It's unsurprising then that fractures increase after hospitalization. And again, not a new idea. This was published over a decade ago that hospitalizations present opportunities <coughs> to reduce risk for fracture. And uh, I would suggest to you that through multiple mechanisms associated with the acute illness, we have bone loss, we have muscle loss, we have CNS issues, that leads to falls and fractures. And so at the time of discharge from hospitalization, we need to think about these things <coughs> and intervene to reduce adverse consequences. So in summary, what to do today? Recognize hospitalization as a time to intervene, whether it's for hip fracture or pneumonia or other medical illness. Recognize the fracture, not just osteoporosis, as the problem. What to do? Reduce falls, think about falls, observe gait, observe patient standing, recognize that obesity may increase, not decrease the risk. Optimize calories, optimize calcium, vitamin D, and protein. Reasonable numbers, I believe, for calcium are 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams daily, 2,000 IUs of vitamin D, and use osteoporosis medicines to treat the bones. And uh, again, uh, going back to the past, this is not news, uh, new concepts. This is Sir William Osler, a Canadian physician, who basically was the founder of the medical model in North America. And he told us over 100 years ago, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient. And I thank you. <laughs>